have to admit, I sent an email to Chris and John earlier this week saying, I'm going rogue with our series, and I'm not preaching on the passage that I said I was going to preach on. Um, so what I am preaching on is Revelation 21. Um, so if you have a Bible with you or can reach one or have a phone with an app or whatever you've got, um, turn with me to Revelation 21. We'll start right in verse 1. It's called a new heaven and a new earth. It says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of the heavens from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these words of hope from your word this morning, and we ask that you teach us from them. Teach us more about who you are and who we are as your people. In your name we pray. Amen. So I have to admit, I'm a bit of an Advent stickler. I'm, I'm kind of a stickler for this, this season of Advent. I love Christmas. We've got our tree up in our house, and we're listening to Christmas music on repeat. And we've got a new Advent calendar this week, and we're doing the whole countdown thing. And it's been a lot of fun. I love Christmas, but I'm really just kind of a stickler for this season of Advent. This is not Christmas time yet. It's the holiday season, sure, but it's not Christmas yet. We're in Advent. Advent for me is this really meaningful four-week time of waiting. That's what it's been in, in church history, and it's, it's become a really meaningful thing for me. I'm, I'm not naturally very good at waiting. I'm not really a very patient person by nature, so I think this kind of spiritual discipline of taking these four weeks of waiting for Christmas and preparing my heart for Christmas has become a really important thing for me. So I've become kind of a, an Advent, I don't know, Scrooge or opposite of Scrooge or whatever you want to call it. But I want to, during Advent, I, I think of the Israelites and what it must have felt like to be waiting for the Messiah generation after generation after generation to have this promise that you held so dearly and was so core to who you were as a people and have to wait years and years and years and years and years. In Advent, I think of Mary, who had a, a visitation from an angel who told her she would have a son, and this, this period of waiting that she had to go through before she was even pregnant, and then while she was pregnant, and then even after Jesus was born, waiting for him to kind of fulfill that call as Messiah that she knew was coming. There was all kinds of waiting. And there just aren't many moments in our lives, in our culture, in our world today that we have to wait. We've gotten really, really good at instant gratification. You know, you want pizza for dinner tonight? You don't have to wait the 45 minutes or so until they deliver it. You can hop on your phone and go on the Domino's app and order a pizza for the specific time you want it to get there, and they can meet you at the door when you get home from work if you want them to. You don't have to wait for your pizza. You don't have to wait to, to hear the news. You don't have to wait for... For packages, I have Amazon Prime at my house, so the longest I have to wait for a package is two days, and lately, kudos to Amazon, they've been doing it in one. So I don't even have to wait for my, you know, my packages and my Christmas presents to come. They're just there at my fingertips. We don't even have to wait for kind of mundane information. We don't have to wonder about things anymore. The other day, Jeremy, my husband, and I were driving around somewhere, and as, of course, I'm sure you've all experienced, but the subject of Bruce Willis came up in the car. <laughs> I don't remember how we got there and what we were talking about, but we just had to know these facts about Bruce Willis. Like, how tall is Bruce Willis? And how many marriages has he had? And who is he married to? Were they all famous people, or were some of them regular people like us? And how old is Bruce Willis? When's his birthday? And there, there was a time in the not-so-distant past, right, where you'd wonder how tall Bruce Willis is, and you'd just have to go, huh, I don't know. <laughs> how tall is Bruce 
Bruce Willis. <laughs> and you'd have to wait until you could, I don't know, find a random biography of Bruce Willis or talk to your super fan <laughs> Bruce Willis watching friend who would know those kinds of crazy things. But now, on this day, we didn't have to wait at all. We said, how tall is Bruce Willis? And I said, well, let me tell you. And I got out my phone and I Googled how tall is Bruce mm -hmm. Willis and it told me. Turns out I'm about as tall as Bruce Willis. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite as buff, but um, we'll work on that. But we, we don't have to wait for things anymore. Even when we want to know ridiculous pieces of information that we don't have any real reason to need to know, we don't have to wait. And that's why I think the season of Advent is difficult for us, but so important that we take the time to kind of sit in this series, the season of Advent. That's why I become kind of a stickler for it. My, some, some favorite comedians of mine um, talk about the Christmas creep. The Christmas creep is on starting November 1st, they say. It's this time, you know, when all of a sudden Halloween is over and then bam, Christmas. I, I remember I, I saw the actual Christmas creep happen this year. I was in Fred Meyer on Halloween in the morning. It was maybe 9.30 or 10 in the morning. And they were taking all of the Halloween things on Halloween and taking them down to get in the bargain bin and replacing it all with Christmas. It was, we didn't even give Thanksgiving its due. It was, it was right into Christmas. We, we don't give it our full attention. We've gotten so good at this Christmas creep, at this instant gratification that it's made me this Advent stickler. I think it's really important for us to take a moment and just sit in Advent, to recognize that those who came before us had to wait years and years and years for Christ to come that first Christmas. We can wait those four weeks or two months if you start in November 1st like our stores do. I think it's such a good practice, this good spiritual discipline to not give in to the Christmas creep fully, but to let ourselves wait, to intentionally wait a bit for Advent. That's a hard thing for us to do, I think. As, as many of you know, if you've been around the harbor for a while, I'm kind of a worship nerd. I love, to, I love to think about liturgy and what we do in worship and why we do it. I haven't been on the piano a whole lot lately, but that's one of my favorite things to get to do is to be, to be with the worship team and lead worship. But the problem with this season is there's just not a lot of Advent songs to sing. We sang one of the great ones this morning, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, one of the very few songs we have that get at this season of waiting. But we just, we don't have a whole lot. There's another another favorite of mine is Come, A Long Expected Jesus, which we've done in years past. Maybe in the next couple of weeks we will. But there just, there's not a whole lot more. I can't think of a whole bit, a lot more than those two off the top of my head. So practically speaking, even in our worship, there's just not a lot of resources to draw from to help us wait in this season of Advent. So we jump into Christmas and we sing Silent Night on December 3rd or whatever it might be. We just don't have a lot of options. So we start throwing in Christmas things. And I have to admit, as this Advent stickler that I am, that pains me a little bit. <laughs> I wish we had more Advent songs to sing and more Advent readings we could do or resources we could do in our worship so that as a church, together, we can slow down and wait. But we love Christmas, right? So we just jump right in. But here we have the gift of Advent, this time to sit and to breathe and to remember God's promises and to take in this season that sets the tone for the rest of what we believe about Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Four whole weeks to practice patience and trust as we wait for Christmas. See, because I think, I think that part of it boils down to trust. To wait for something is to trust that it's coming and to recognize that you're not in control of it coming. Now, of course, we, we know Christmas is coming, right? Barring the apocalypse, we can look at our calendars and see that the 25th is coming and we can plan our Christmas parties and our family gatherings and all those. We know that it's coming, but there's something about the practice of waiting that changes our hearts in the meantime. There's something about intentionally stopping and pausing for a moment that changes how we experience 
the Christmas season and maybe even changes who are who we are in the Christmas season. Something about putting ourselves in the shoes of the Israelites as they waited for the Messiah, or putting ourselves in the shoes of Mary as she waited for her baby boy. That changes our experience of it. It changes us. Plus, the reality is we're still waiting. We know that Christmas is coming. Christ has already come. He was born and he lived and he died and he rose again. But we're still waiting. And that's what these words from Revelation this morning are all about. Advent, you see, isn't just about Christmas. It's not just four weeks of waiting for Christmas on December 25th. It's a time when we remember the fact that we're still waiting. Just like all those who came before us, we're still waiting. Just like the Israelites waited for the Messiah, we are still waiting. Christ has promised to come again. He's promised to come again to fully complete the work that he began on that first Christmas day. He's promised to come again with the new heaven and the new earth like we read about this morning in Revelation. He's promised to come again and wipe away our tears, to take away sickness and death and mourning and hardship. And we're still waiting. This world is not as it should be, but this is our hope. These words from Revelation that we read this morning are our hope. This is the ultimate miracle of Christmas, that Christ will come again to finally set things all right. Christ has lived, Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ is coming again. But we're still waiting. In the United States this year, we've had 355 mass shootings in 336 days. Maybe a couple more since I wrote that down. Maybe more days, but 355 shootings in more days than that this year. The world is not as it should be, and we're still waiting. (laughs) Over three million people, men, women, children, babies, have fled their home country of Syria to flee terrorism and war and violence. And approximately 6.5 million more are displaced in Syria itself. We're still waiting. In King County, Right here where we live, about 4,000 people each night go to sleep outside because they can't afford a place to live. We're still waiting. In the last year alone, we saw drought and tornadoes and floods and hurricanes and earthquakes and devastating haze in Southeast Asia, all of these things polluting and destroying our world and homes and livelihoods all over the world. We're still waiting. We've seen violence and terrorism and bombings and shootings and war and starvation and and unable to pay rent even though you're working. All of these things that show us the world is not as it should be. Here at Harbor Church, we've experienced death of friends and loved ones that we still mourn and carry that pain. We've experienced sickness and health issues. We've experienced parenting issues and problems with our kids, problems with our friends, problems with schools, problems with our bodies. We've we've had all kinds of fears and disappointments and heartaches. The world is not as it should be, and we are still waiting. We see injustice after injustice and hardship after hardship, and no, we're still waiting. But we know that Jesus has come. Christmas has happened. We get to celebrate it every year. That's what this season of Advent is leading us towards. And yet he's not done with us yet. He's got more to do. Christ has come and he defeated death and sin, and yet we still experience death. And we still experience the effects of sin in our lives and relationships and workplaces and in our world. But we're still waiting. Jesus is coming, and we're still waiting. Listen again to these words from Revelation. A loud voice from the throne says, Look, 
God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And then he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. This is our hope. This is the ultimate grace of Christmas. This is the ultimate promise that Christ gives us. Jesus came that first Christmas to live among us and die for us and be raised for us to defeat death and sin and hardship and pain. And he's coming again to complete that victory, to take it away for good once and for all. But we're still waiting for that ultimate victory, aren't we? Death is defeated, yet we still experience it. Sin has no hold, yet we still see its effects all around us and in us and through us. Jesus has promised to come again, to once and for all make all those sad things come untrue. He's going to come to finally set things right and make the world as it should be. That's what we're waiting for. That's what Advent is all about. It's more than just waiting for Christmas on December 25th. Because we're still waiting. And we have this hope that Christ is coming again to make things new and set things right. We're waiting for Christmas, yes. We're preparing our hearts to celebrate that all-important day that makes the rest of our belief and our faith so important to our lives. <clears throat> and we remember this Advent that we are still waiting. One of my favorite tellings of this, and I, I, I read this last year, I can't remember actually if I read it or Jeremy read it in the sermon, but one of my favorite kind of tellings of Advent comes from the Jesus Storybook Bible. Um, which, if you have kids or grandkids or kids that you love, this is a great Christmas present. But um, the telling in this Bible of the words of Isaiah are just really beautiful. And I think the best telling that I've heard of this hope of Advent that we have now. Um, I had hoped to have the pictures up on the screen, and then we had some technical difficulties this morning. So I'm going to do this teacher style. Um, <laughs> and I'll read it this way, and hopefully not drop everything, but this is the telling of Isaiah and Isaiah's prophecies from the Jesus Story of the Bible, and it's entitled Operation No More Tears. It's written like a letter from God to us. So it says, Dear little flock, you're all wandering away from me like sheep in an open field. You've always been running away from me, and now you're, you're lost. You can't find your way back, but I can't stop loving you. I will come and find you. So I'm sending you a shepherd with a capital S to look after you and love you, to carry you home to me. Yes, someone is going to come and rescue you, but he won't be who anyone expects. He will be a king, but he won't live in a palace, and he won't have lots of money. He will be poor, and he'll be a servant, but this king will heal the whole world. He will be a hero. He will fight for his people and rescue them from their enemies, but he won't have big armies, and he won't fight with swords. He'll make the blind see, and he'll make the lame leap like a deer. He'll make everything the way it was always meant to be. He'll make everything it was always meant to be, but people will hate him, and they won't listen to him. He will be like a lamb, and he will suffer and die. It's the secret rescue plan we made from before the beginning of the world. It's the only way to get you back. But he won't stay dead. I'll make him alive again. And one day, when he comes back to rule forever, the mountains and the trees will dance and sing for joy. The earth will shout out loud, and his fame will fill the whole earth as the waters cover the sea. Everything's sad will come untrue. I love that line. Everything sad will come untrue. Even death is going to die, and he will wipe away every tear from every eye. Yes, the rescuer is going to come. Look for him. Watch for him. Wait for him. 
He will come, I promise. And it ends, signed, love God. <laughs> I love that telling of it. That's so beautiful. Um, amen. <laughs> that's, that's our hope this Advent. That's what we wait for, and that's what we celebrate in Advent and at Christmas, that Christ has come, Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for that promise. We thank you for that reminder this Advent that we're still waiting for you. We look forward to Christmas and we look forward to celebrating your birthday and that the Rescuer has come. And we look forward with great hope to the day when you come again to finish the work that you started that first Christmas. We pray. Amen. Amen.